October 16, 1846, William Thomas Green Morton, a local dentist, performs the first public demonstration of anesthesia at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. Though the operation, performed by one Dr. John Collins Warren, ultimately failed, Morton's administration of ether did succeed in rendering the patient unconscious and completely numb. When the patient emerged from the anesthetic and reported having felt no pain, Warren turned to the audience and said, Gentlemen, this is no humbug. This day ranks among the most iconic in the history of medicine, for it was the moment when Boston, and indeed the United States, began the journey towards public acceptance of pain relief. But what was truly invented that day? Not a chemical. The substance used by Morton turned out to be simply ether, a familiar party drug that had been in common use for decades. And not the idea of anesthesia. Pain is the oldest medical problem and the universal physical affliction of mankind. What that great moment in Boston really marked was something less tangible but far more significant. A huge cultural shift in the idea of pain. The real milestone witnessed that day in Boston was the moment when culture had finally caught up with chemistry. The ancient man sought relief from pain just as we do today. Civilization after civilization experimented with primitive methods of pain relief in the search for the answer. In many cases, deities were created to provide some form of comfort by sophisticated cultures such as the Greeks, the Romans, the Babylonians, the Chinese, and the Indians. In addition to the creation of deities, these cultures had several primal pain relieving drugs at their disposal, such as alcohol, mandragora wine, henbane, hemp, and opium, as far back as 550 BCE. Other methods of pain relief included induced concussions, nerve compressions, hypnosis, and bloodletting, which continued to be in popular practice until the 1840s. But these primitive pain relievers did not progress very far due to the development of a new social perception. Beginning in both Greek and Jewish traditions was the frequent association of pain with divine punishment. In contrast, these cultures believed that righteousness would confer immunity. The later development of Christianity built upon these traditionally founded beliefs. With Christianity came a concept of relief from pain through divine healing, as God conferred upon priests the power to purify through prayer. This tradition invested priests and later physicians with great status, authority, and responsibility. Most importantly though, expansion of medical care by the church caused the practice of medicine to acquire religious overtones. The Renaissance of the 15th and 16th centuries encouraged much remarkable advancement in medical practices, and with the declining influence of the church, pain was no longer coupled with the idea of divine punishment, and surgery made astounding progress. An end to the cauterizing of wounds and the introduction of the ligature, for example, took away much of the barbarism of earlier medicine. However, just as surgery looked as if it were beginning to progress, it stopped. Fundamentally, surgery didn't change for an incredible 300 years. It wasn't until society began to industrialize in the early 19th century that medicine began to transform yet again. The introduction of anesthesia into 19th century American society can be told in the light of several influential men. In the early 1800s, Sir Humphrey Davy, an esteemed scientific researcher, had recognized the anesthetic properties of nitrous oxide. In 1842, W.E. Clark became the first person to administer ether as a dental anesthetic during a tooth extraction. The true story of surgical anesthesia, however, begins with Dr. Crawford W. Long, a small-town doctor who established his practice in Jefferson, Georgia. Being the only doctor for miles around, Long was often called upon to provide nitrous oxide for the frivolous laughing gas parties of the townsfolk. On one occasion, Long provided ether instead, and having attended the party himself, happened to notice that several of the guests, while stumbling around incoherently, had sustained bruises but had felt no pain. 
Long began experimenting and finally, on March 30, 1842, he became the first person to use ether as a surgical anesthetic. The operation was a complete success. His patient was rendered unconscious and awoke with no recollection of the procedure. Overjoyed by his success, Long continued to use ether on all his future patients, each case a triumph. Unfortunately, though, neither Clark nor Long published their accounts of ether. This simple fact created quite a bit of turmoil within the medical community. Within months of Long's use of ether, other doctors began to catch on, among them Charles Jackson and William T.G. Morton. Jackson, having seen Long's demonstration, immediately tried to claim credit upon returning to Harvard. To add to the confusion, another doctor, Horace Wells, attended a laughing gas party and came to the separate conclusion that nitrous oxide would be a wonderful dental anesthetic. Morton took the initiative, though, and succeeded in a public demonstration of ether on October 16, 1846. Within days, worldwide attention was being paid to the new anesthetic, and in the glow of all the publicity, Jackson, Morton, and Wells each claimed to have discovered ether, while Long stayed silent of his own accord for some time. This bickering between these doctors eventually became so bitter that Congress intervened in 1847 to decide the first discoverer. This matter, called the Ether Controversy, occupied Congress for 16 years, even during the onset of the Civil War. A final decision was never made. Before 1846, all surgery was agony. Because of 1846, pain in surgery was averted. And since 1846, science has gained control over pain. Anesthesia won acceptance with unprecedented speed in the 19th century. Within three months of the demonstration, most major world medical institutions were employing ether anesthetic, and the frequencies of surgeries increased dramatically. This rapid diffusion shows the transforming social conceptions of the late 19th century, as pain and suffering began to lose their social and religious connotations. The inhalation of ether had many disadvantages. The drug was volatile in nature and caused throat irritation, vomiting, and carried with it a high mortality rate. Because of these observations, doctors began an intense search for new pain-relieving drugs. Chloroform was introduced by Dr. James Simpson in the late 1800s and was a much more tolerable alternative to ether. Simpson made other huge advancements by pioneering for anesthesia's use in childbirth. This new concept won great appeal when Dr. John Snow administered chloroform to Queen Victoria during the birth of her son. Um, and Queen Victoria, is, in essence, broke the taboo against anesthesia for obstetrics when she uh, had it for the birth of Leopold. In 1844, Carl Kohler first introduced cocaine as a local anesthetic. This new drug was not inhaled, but injected into tissue. It did not induce sleep and numbed only a portion of the body. Huge advancements in drugs and technology continued to be made, eventually leading to the complex anesthetics that we use today. The best is yet to come, and babe, won't it be fine? You can argue that there's not, you know, there's only a handful of things that have really dramatically altered health care over the past couple of thousand years and being able to give us a certain point. In modern medicine, anesthesia is usually induced through the injection of an intravenous drug and not by inhalation, which prevents lung irritation. Mixtures of inhaled gases and oxygen are used to maintain an appropriate state of sleep, while general, local, and regional anesthetics are used to numb the pain. These drugs are used along with separate, non-anesthetic muscle paralytics for a potent and perfected mixture. Today, anesthesia is a highly evolved and scientific process, and pain relief is a given in all situations. But without the medical research of the pioneering physicians of the 19th century, the complex surgeries of modern medicine would have been simply impossible. The best is yet to come, come a day or mine Ah, come a day or mine I'm gonna...